Now before starting general anesthetics, we need to define a few terms. What is general anesthesia? Now general anesthesia is drug-induced reversible loss of consciousness and all sensations. It includes analgesia, amnesia, muscle relaxation, and abolition of reflexes. Local anesthesia is applied topically or injected locally and block nerve conduction and cause reversible loss of all sensation in the parts supplied by the nerve. Next is dissociative anesthesia, which is characterized by sedation, amnesia, marked analgesia, and unresponsiveness to commands and dissociation from the surroundings. It is also called out-of-body experience, as if you are in the OT and seeing yourself from above. Lastly, what is conscious sedation? It is a level of CNS depression where a patient does not lose consciousness but is able to communicate and cooperate during the procedure or any treatment. Now let's look at the stages of anesthesia. The first stage is the stage of analgesia. In this, consciousness is not completely lost, it is just impaired. The patient feels drowsy and there is decreased awareness of pain. There is amnesia sometimes. The second stage is that of disinhibition. The consciousness is lost. There is increased sympath sympathetic activity such as excitement, pupils are dilated, Heart rate is increased, blood pressure is increased, muscle tone is increased, respiration becomes irregular, and reflexes are enhanced. Amnesia in this stage is for sure. The next stage is that of surgical anesthesia. The patient is completely unconscious, there is no pain reflex, respiration becomes regular, muscles relax, reflexes are lost, intercostal muscles are completely paralyzed, and the BP and all the vitals, respiration, etc. should be maintained in this stage. If not, there is the stage of medullary paralysis. In this stage, the respiration and vasomotor centers in the medulla are completely depressed and if the vitals are not maintained, death may occur in a few minutes. Now to simplify, the anesthetic protocol includes five main things. Firstly, there is induction of anesthesia, then there is the maintenance of anesthesia, then there is skeletal muscle relaxation analgesia and lastly vital sign monitoring by EEG or BP etc. Now two important concepts before we classify the general anesthetics are minimum alveolar concentration that is the MAC value of an anesthetic. It is basically the minimum alveolar concentration of any anesthetic that should be there to prevent response to a standardized painful stimulus in 50% of the people. Now what, what is its significance? The MAC value is actually inversely related to the potency. That means increased MAC value of an anesthetic means that the anesthetic is less potent and vice versa. The second important concept is the blood gas ratio or the blood gas partition coefficient. What it is basically it is the ratio of the anesthetic that is plasma protein bound to the free form. Now what does that mean? We know that plasma, bound, uh, plasma proteins cannot cross the blood brain barriers so whatever amount of the anesthetic that is attached to the plasma proteins cannot cause anesthesia. So the more the free form the more the free molecules are available to maintain the equilibrium with the brain and cause anesthesia. So decreased value of the ratio means the anesthetic is better. Now let's look at the mechanism of action of the general anesthetics. We know that the reticular formation of the brain stem is basically responsible to maintain consciousness in a patient. Now there are some stimulatory neurons which stimulate the reticular formation and keep us awake and then there are inhibitory neurons which inhibit the reticular formation and put us to sleep or anesthesia. Now our goal here is to inhibit the stimulatory neurotransmission and stimulate or accentuate the inhibited neurotransmission. We can interfere in this normal physiology by two ways. Firstly, we can do GABA mediated current accentuation by halogenation, anesthetics or ether. Secondly, we can also stimulate the strychnine sensitive glycine receptor by ether. Both these ways we are stimulating the inhibitory neurons so that they can inhibit the reticular formation. Secondly, what we can do is to inhibit the stimulatory neurons.
We do this by basically inhibiting the NMDA receptor, which is basically a glutamate receptor, and glut glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. The chief general anesthetics that act by this pathway are nitrous oxide, ketamine, and halogenated anesthetics. Secondly, we can also inhibit the acetylcholine, which is also an excitatory neurotransmitter, by halogenated anesthetics. Now let's do the classification of general anesthetics. Depending upon the mode of administration, they are divided into inhalational and parenteral general anesthetics. We'll do the inhalational general anesthetics in this video and in the next one we'll do the parenteral. The inhalational general anesthetics are further divided into volatile anesthetics and the gases. The volatile anesthetics are then further divided into halogenated and non-halogenated compounds. The halogenated ones are not inflammable while the non-halogenated are inflammable. Now the main four halogenated general anesthetics are halothane, isoflurane, desflurane and sevoflurane. The non-halogenated inflammable is chiefly ether and the gas is nitrous oxide. Now we'll do a comparative analysis of all these general anesthetics on the basis of some properties. The first is the MAC value. Now I'm going to write all of the MAC values for all of these general anesthetics and then you can see which one is the most potent and which one is the least potent. Now on the basis of these MAC values, we come to know that nitrous oxide is an incomplete anesthetic, it is not potent and surgery cannot be performed under this alone. We have to mix it with some other anesthetic to do that. The second property is the blood gas coefficient. I'll write the blood gas coefficients of all of these. Now we could not find the exact um, blood gas coefficient for ether but we know that it is very uh, slow in the induction and recovery that means it has a large blood gas coefficient. Now we can see here that the largest blood gas coefficient which are mentioned here is the second largest of course is that of halothane so the induction and recovery is faster than ether. Next isoflurane is rapid than halothane, desflurane and sevoflurane are also rapid because of the low blood, blood gas coefficient and nitrous oxide is also rapid acting. Let's see which one are used for induction and which ones are used for the maintenance of anesthesia. Halothane is used for both induction and maintenance. Isoflurane is used for the maintenance only because it is irritate, it is an irritant and irritates the air passages. It also has a pungent odor. Desflurane is only used for maintenance, it is also an irritant. Sevoflurane can be used both for the induction and maintenance because it is not pungent or irritant. Ether can also be used for induction and maintenance for the same reasons and so is nitrous oxide. Now let's see if these general anesthetics have analgesic properties. Halothane is a poor analgesic Isoflurane, desflurane and sevoflurane are good analgesics while ether and nitrous oxide are excellent analgesics. The muscle relaxant properties of these um, general anesthetics go as halothane is a poor muscle relaxant although it can potentiate the actions of detubocurarine Isoflurane, desflurane and sevoflurane are good muscle relaxants while ether and nitrous oxide uh, ether is good muscle relaxant it decreases the dose of detubocurarine required while nitrous oxide is a poor muscle relaxant. Now let's see if uh, these general anesthetics have any effect on increasing the sensitization of the heart to catecholamines. Now Halothane does that. It increases the sensitivity of the heart to catecholamines and this is not very good. 
because it can increase the blood pressure and all sort of that sympathetic stimulation which is not required in an operating room. Now let's see the effects of these anesthetics on the lungs and airways. Halothane is a bronchodilator which is good and it is not even irritating so it can be used in asthmatic patients. Isoflurane is a bronchodilator but it is an irritant as we mentioned so we should not give them in asthma. Same goes for desflurane and sevoflurane is not an irritant so and it also has bronchodilating properties so this is also safe for asthmatics while ether what it does it it is an irritant it increases the secretions of bronch bronchioles it also causes laryngeal spasm and atropine should be used to overcome this so definitely not use in asthmatic patients now let's see if these general anesthetics cause any hepatotoxicity this is only a feature of halothane it causes hepatotoxicity on repeated use and in obese patients now any other inhaled anesthetic has not been reported to cause any sort of hepatotoxicity yet. Lastly, let's see what they are preferred for and what are the uses. Now, halothane is preferred for children. Isoflurane is preferred for neurologic procedures because it does not cause seizures. Desflurane is used in OPD because of rapid onset and recovery and so is sevoflurane. Ether is obsolete now. Now we have two important properties to describe separately for nitrous oxide. First is second gas effect. Now what is second gas effect? Second gas effect will explain why we use halothane and nitrous oxide together in anesthesia. Now when halothane is used in combination with nitrous oxide, what happens is that due to the decreased blood gas partition fraction of nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide rapidly moves to the blood. Thus the partial pressure of nitrous oxide in alveoli decreases, increasing the partial pressure of halothane. So the anesthetic action of halothane is also increased. Remember that the second gas in this effect is nitrous oxide, not halothane. The second effect is diffusional hypoxia. Now after the operation ends, when nitrous oxide supply is cut off, as nitrous oxide has decreased affinity for blood, it rapidly leaves blood and fills the alveoli and causes the partial pressure of oxygen to decrease, leading to hypoxia. To counteract this, the anesthetician will give 100% oxygen for some time after the surgery is over. Normally, during the procedure, the oxygen is about 30% and the other 70% is the anesthesia. Yeah. Lastly, two important side effects, one for halothane and one for nitrous oxide. Now, halothane can cause malignant hyperthermia. How that happens is that skeletal muscle sarcoplasmic reticulum has special receptors known as rhinodine receptor channels. Now, when something is wrong genetically with these channels, now, whenever exposed to triggering chemicals such as halothane, there is massive release of calcium and there is also problem with sequestration of calcium. So increased intracellular calcium will increase the muscle contraction, raising 1 degree centigrade every 5 minutes. The important side effect for nitrous oxide is megaloblastic anemia. How that happens is that it impairs the DNA synthesis by inhibition of methionine synthase. That's all for inhalational general anesthetics.